Hi everybody, Physics Ninja here. I previously made a video on Coulomb's law uh, that involved typically three charges in different arrangements. And I used uh, Coulomb's law to calculate the force on one of those charges in those different arrangements. Now that video uh, was a little bit more complicated, a more complicated application of Coulomb's law because there were three charges. Now I'll link uh, that video in the description of this one here. So you can go ahead and watch that video. Uh, today what I want to do is I want to do more of an introduction to Coulomb's law and solve more basic problems. Let's make sure we understand uh, what this equation means and how you use it to solve simpler problems. All right, so we have four example problems in this video. I'll also uh, have some introduction that we're gonna look at some different cases. Like with all my videos, if you like it, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing to my channel. It's the best way to support what I do. All right, let's get started. All right, we start with basics here. Uh, for us, charges come in two flavors, right? Positives and negative charges. And for us, the charges are going to be measured in coulombs. Okay, that is the proper SI unit uh, that we're going to use. Uh, for example, positive uh, charge might be positive one coulomb, right? This would be uh, an example. Uh, we might have minus three coulombs for a negative charge. Um, now, charges can typically come in or different orders of magnitude, right? A positive, a small positive charge might be one, say, 0.2 microcoulomb. Okay, and again, now if I have microcoulomb, again, when we're going to be using uh, Coulomb's law, we want to convert that to coulomb. So it's going to be good to remember our factors, right? So micro, for example, is 10 to the minus 6 coulombs. A uh, negative charge might be... Uh, minus, say, 5.3 nanocoulomb. All right, again, I want to convert that to coulombs. Again, I'm dealing with a uh, prefix nano. So you have to remember that nano is associated with 10 to the minus 9 coulombs. Okay, um, so we're going to see different orders of magnitudes for different charges. Uh, the goal here is always to convert them to get coulombs at the end of the day before we use Coulomb's law. All right, let's now look at forces acting between charges. All right, we're now interested in the direction of the electrical force, and I have four different scenarios here. In case A over here, I have two positive charges separated by uh, some distance R. In case B, I have a positive and a negative charge separated by some distance. Case C, I have two negatives. In case D, again, a negative and a positive. My goal here is just to show the direction of the electrical force acting on every single charge here. All right, and there's basically two rules to remember, all right? Uh, rules are very, very simple. Opposites attract, right? And if they're like charges, two positives or two negatives, those charges repel each other. So let's go to uh, case A right here. Uh, case A, I have two like charges. They're two positive charges. So that means if I go here on the right charge, there is a force acting on it in this direction right here. So my line's not super straight. Uh, there is a force acting on the other charge in the opposite direction, okay? These forces have the exact same magnitude, the same length, okay? So that's really important. How about case B over here? Case B, I have a positive and a negative charge. These are opposite charges, right? One's positive, one's negative. So that means they attract each other. So if I go ahead and plot the force on the positive charge, I have to do something like this. And if I go plot the force on the negative charge, I do something like this. All right, pretty straightforward. Again, the magnitude of these vectors are exactly the same, but they're in opposite direction. All right, what about case C? These are like charges, two negatives. I know that the force repel. These charges repel each other, right? So the forces have to act in different direction. Um, so in the last case is case D. Again, we have... Uh, opposite charges, a negative and a positive. So these forces have to be in opposite directions. The magnitude of these vectors have to be the same. All right, and we're going to see how to calculate the magnitude in just a minute. That is the use of Coulomb's law. But to know the direction, just remember this, right? Opposites attract, like charges repel each other. That allows you to write the direction of this vector on each one of these charges just by knowing the signs of the charges. All right, we look at case A here in a little bit more detail. I just want to just make one important point about this. If I call this force F1 and I call this force F2, 
All right, the key here is, I said this before, but I really wanna highlight it. If you calculate the magnitude of this force, I put these parallel lines here to tell me how big is that vector? What's the length of it? This here has to be the exact same magnitude as F2. So a lot of times I'm just going to call it F, okay? F is going to be the magnitude of that vector measured in Newtons. All right, that is very, very important. The other uh, important characteristics of F1 and F2, F1 is in the opposite direction of F2. Okay, opposite of F2, different direction. Let me just write direction here. All right, and the last point that's super important is that these forces, they act on different charges. Just write that down. This is a very, very important part. If you combine these three statements about F1 and F2, this is really Newton's third law here at work. Newton's third law has three characteristics. It says for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Uh, both of the forces have to have uh, the same magnitude. We have that. Both of the forces have to act in opposite directions. We have that. And most importantly, they have to act on different objects, in this case, different charges. F1 is acting on this charge, on the left charge. F2 is acting on the rightmost charge right here. They're not acting on the same charge. All right, we know how to calculate or how to find the direction of the force acting on the individual charges if you know the signs. The next thing we want to know is how to calculate how big the force is. All right, and for that, we're going to use Coulomb's law. All right, Coulomb's law says this, that the magnitude of the force, so just, I don't have to put a vector on it, I'm only getting a number here, is given by this value here. Now, there is a constant term in the front. We'll define all these in just a minute. All right, depends on some constant. It also is proportional to the amount of charge of each one. So for example, if this one here has a charge Q1, this one here has a charge Q2, Coulomb's law says it's proportional to each charge and it's the product of both of them. Now it is also inversely proportional to the distance between the charges from center to center. So in this diagram here, the center to center distance is labeled as R. So in Coulomb's law, it is inversely proportional to the squared of the distance. This is called an inverse squared law. Because, well, it's inverse because the distance appears in the denominator and it's squared. So you call that an inverse square law. Now, um, so let's look at the individual terms. Uh, this value epsilon zero is something referred to as the permittivity, just write this down, of free space. It is just a number, okay, oops, <laughs> of free space. Uh, the value, if you kind of Google it or look it up in the textbook, um, rather complicated, it's 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12. Now it has some kind of uh, odd units. The units, I'll just write them down in SI units, Coulomb squared, Newtons per meter squared. But the only thing you have to remember is that this is just a number. It's not, okay, nothing more complicated than that, okay? The units work out that if you multiply everything out, remember in the, we have charges up here in the numerator and I have distance in the denominator squared. So at the end, if I wanna get a force measured in SI units, which is Newtons, um, you have to have some complicated units for this constant in order to take care of all the dimensions of these other terms. Now, what's often done here is, in many textbooks, is another definition is added just to simplify this expression a little bit. And that's what we're gonna do now. So sometimes they introduce a new constant called K, and K is they just group together these other terms here group them all together, and if you calculate that, put that in the calculator, you know the value of the permittivity of free space. What you get is a number that looks like 8.99 times 10 to the nine. Now it's big, right, because you're dividing by this epsilon zero. And now the units all get kind of mixed together now in this new constant. This is Newtons meters squared per Coulomb squared. Now, for our purposes, for the rest of this video, instead of doing 8.99, a lot of textbooks also just write 9.0. 
times 10 to the 9. Again, same units, newtons, meters squared per coulomb squared. So let me just highlight that value here. So this is what we're going to use for the remainder of uh, the video in order to calculate the magnitude. So what does that mean for Coulomb's law? Well, that means that I could just, let's just simplify it a little bit, right? Instead of always having this one divided by four pi epsilon zero, I'm just going to introduce a constant K here. And this is kind of a nice short way of writing Coulomb's law. So let me just move that over. All right, now, now what we want to do is let's apply this equation to several different cases just to see how the numbers work out when we use Coulomb's law to calculate the magnitude of the forces. All right, here's our first example. I am going to have two positive charges here. Uh, one is 1.2 micro coulombs, that's Q1. Q2 is a little bit bigger, right? 6.3 micro coulombs. And both of these charges are separated by a distance measured from center to center of three meters. Uh, the goal is to calculate how big the force is. So, um, first of all, we know the direction of the force. They're two positive charges, so it's exactly like in this diagram. We know those repel each other. So you know the direction of the force. We, what we're interested in is how big is this vector? So for that, we're going to use Coulomb's law. In Coulomb's law, you simply do this. Now you substitute in all our numbers. Uh, the K constant, Coulomb's constant, is 9.0 times 10 to the 9. I'm not going to write all these units anymore. That's just way too much work. Uh, Q1 is 1.2. Now it's in micro Coulomb. You have to convert that to Coulombs in order to get Newtons at the end here. So that's times 10 to the minus 6 Coulombs. Uh, the other charge is 6.3 times 10 to the minus 6. Again, we're dealing with micro coulombs. Now you divide it by, divide it by the distance squared. In this case, it's 3 meters. And don't forget to square that value. All right, so what do we get? You put those numbers in the calculator, and that gives you the magnitude of 7.56 times 10 to the minus 3. And that there is measured in newtons because I've taken care of all the units. Okay, so we know that this force here, this is very important, 7.56 times 10 to the minus 3 newtons. And the force acting on this charge is also 7.56 times 10 to the minus 6 newtons. So this force over here is the force acting on Q1, right? Maybe write a little subscript. And the force acting on Q2, well, just write it like this. The vectors are in opposite directions, but they have the exact same magnitude. All right, in the next example, I want to have a negative and a positive force interacting with each other. Let's go see how you apply Newton's, uh, sorry, Coulomb's law for that case. All right, here's example two. We have a positive charge of three nanocoulombs and a negative charge of minus 5.2 microcoulombs. They're separated by a small distance. Let's go ahead now and look at the forces acting on each charge. Since they're opposite, we know that those charges will attract each other. And there's going to be the force F acting on this one, the force F acting on that one. Well, now we want to calculate how big the force is. We have to use Coulomb's law for that. So you simply say F is equal to uh, 9 times 10 to the 9. What else? Uh, Q1 now is 3 nanocoulombs. 3 times 10 to the minus 9, right? Nano is associated with 10 to the minus 9 coulombs. Uh, Q2 is minus 5.2 micro coulombs. Now, well, I'm just going to go ahead and substitute in like this, minus 5.2, 10 to the minus six coulombs. And now I'm going to divide by the distance squared. It's 1.4 millimeters. Uh, milli is 10 to the minus three uh, meters. And then don't forget to square that value. 10 to the minus three. <laughs> All right, you put the numbers in your calculator. I'm going to get minus 71.6 newtons. Now clearly the magnitude of F is simply 71.6 newtons, right? So what does the negative sign tell you? So this is really uh, an important point, a key point that I want to highlight for everything that you do here. If you get negative, it's because you put in at least one negative charge here, right? So then when you evaluate the product, you get a negative number. Uh, at the end of the day, this negative sign will simply tell me that it's an attractive force, okay? But it's up to you to go on the diagram, and you should know that it's an attractive force simply looking at one's positive and one's negative, and that's the rule. 
So a lot of times people don't even include the signs of the charge when they calculate, uh, when they use Coulomb's law. Because at the end, whether you even have, say you use a positive value, right? What if I just put the magnitude of the charge? Well, in that case, I would get a force of 71.6, and that's okay. Uh, because I know that I, there's one positive and one negative, and I know that those are attractive. So I'm getting the same magnitude at the end of the day, and I'm getting the same direction because I, I know what's going on here between both of those charges. So it's kind of up to you as to whether or not you want to just put in minuses or plus, but keep in mind, if you do put the signs of the charges here this is a key point that if you get a negative number it means it's an attractive force if you get a positive value it means it's a repulsive force between the charges all right let's move on all right a lot of times we are presented problems that i call ratio problems where i'll show you an example here so let's take this top situation here and let the force f um be the force between charge Q1 and Q2 when they're separated by distance R. I can use Coulomb's law to calculate that magnitude if I knew everything else. But sometimes you're just given a situation. They say, like, what happens now to the force if I would double each charge? Right? Does the force get bigger or get smaller and so forth? These are ratio types problems. So uh, what I would do here is, well, instead of having the charge Q1, if I double each charge, what happens? Well, let's go ahead and figure it out. Instead of having a charge Q1 here, if I double it, I'm going to get two times Q1. If I double this charge, I'm going to be two times Q2. Well, what would happen to the force now if I doubled each charge? Well, let's calculate the new force. I'll call it F nu. So we still have the same constant K. Now, instead of having Q1 over here, what do I have? I have 2Q1. Instead of having a charge Q2, in this case, I've doubled it. I have 2Q2. And now I still have the same distance between them because I haven't said that I've changed that distance. So this is still divided over R squared. Now, what you want to do now is you want to take all the numbers here and you want to bring them all the way to the front. Okay, so in this case, I have... I have a 2 here and I have a 2 here. If I multiply that out, I get a factor of 4. And look at everything else. I get K, Q1, Q2 over R squared. Well, look at this term here if I put a bracket in front of it. This is simply what the force F was for the previous case. So that means in this case, I'm going to have four times the force I had in the top case. Right? So the force is now going to be four times bigger. So if you draw a vector like this for F, again, attractive force. In this case, I would have to make that vector four times bigger. This would be four times F. All right, let's look at two more uh, ratio type problems. All right, again, we're going to start with uh, let F be the force between Q1 and Q2 here. Uh, given by Coulomb's law. Example four asks, what happens now if you double one of the charges and I triple the distance? All right, so let's go ahead and make the distance farther. Uh, let's just move it here. Okay, now the charges, I'm only going to double one of the charges. So let's just double, it doesn't matter which one you pick, let's make this one 2Q1. That means that the other one doesn't change because I only double one of the charges. Now I'm tripling the distance. So that means that the distance now from center to center is going to be three times R. All right, how does the new force compare to the first force? Well, for this one, we just simply substitute now into Coulomb's law. So I have K. Now I substitute the first charge, 2Q1. I substitute the second charge, Q2. And now I've tripled the distance. Now you've got to be careful here because you get 3R but you have to square that factor. All right, so what I want to do now is I want to bring all the numbers to the front. So I'm going to have a two. Okay, I have a two from uh, that doubling of the charge. Now look in the denominator what I have. When I square this, I'm going to get nine R squared. So I'm gonna get a factor of nine that comes out in the front. Now everything else just looks like Coulomb's law if I have all the remaining terms and I have R squared here. Well, guess what? This here is nothing more than the force in the top picture. So I get two ninths multiplied by the force. So this force went you know, from a value F 
And now when I made these changes, I get a value that is two ninths that value. Okay, so the force went down because the distance has a bigger impact than doubling the charge. All right, this is kind of a good example of changing several things and how it affects the force.